edition of our guest speaker series. Uh, it's been a, a really well attended series of events this year and tonight's no different. Uh, but uh, tonight we're welcoming uh, someone from quite farther away than our usual guest. Uh, he's coming to us all the way from Virginia. So he's made the long trek up here. Uh, so tonight's speaker is Michael Block. Uh, and I do have a little bit of something prepared to read about him. Um, so I I might as well go through with it since I took the time to print it out. So, <laughs> I'm about to figure out what's going on right here. So, you got all done. <coughs> I'll pontificate for a little bit. Uh, so, Michael Block uh, has been uh, heavily involved with the uh, Cedar Mountain battlefield and has been giving tutors tours of that battlefield as well as others for over two decades now. And is heavily involved in sort of the Civil War history of Culpeper and Fauquier County. I had to ask how to pronounce that one, so. It'd be dangerous. That was right. Yeah, That's right. yeah. <laughs> yeah it's, it's, it's a doozy if I went the wrong way. Um, uh, but Mike also collects letters, drawings, and first person accounts of a lot of the events in that area, uh, both the significant and mundane, as it was put. Uh, but uh, this past January, his first book, The Carnage Was Fearful, which is for sale here in the gift store. So. <laughs> Wink, wink. Um, uh, Battle of Cedar Mountain, August 9th, 1862, was published by Savas Beattie as part of the Emerging Civil War series. So if anybody is a fan of that series, this one is right up there with the best. Uh, he's also been published in Blue and Gray Magazine, Hollow Ground, and most recently in North and South Magazine. Uh, he's a past board member of the Friends of Cedar Mountain Battlefield and the Brandy Station, Found Brandy Station Foundation and uh, served on the Culpeper and Fauquier County Civil War Assessment Centennial Committees. Uh, but he also continues to volunteer for the Friends of Cedar Mountain and is also a tour guide for the Fredericksburg Battlefield Tour. So obviously he's got a lot of credentials to his name when it comes to Civil War Battlefields in Virginia, and we're very happy that he's come up here to uh, talk to us. Uh, this is actually the second time he's been here. Uh, he was here a few years ago, years ago and uh, I had to show him everything around because he didn't even present in this room. That's how long ago it was. So, uh, but we're happy to have him back, and uh, I'll let him share all of his wealth of information with us. Thank you. We won't go too far. Okay, so a couple things I want to talk about before I get into this is uh, these battlefields are living and breathing kind of kind of uh, uh, I call it, they, they, we call them primary source documents because they witnessed what happened out there, and we're very fortunate that since 2014. We've been trying to get a state park in Culpeper County for, for these two battlefields, Brandy Station and, and, and Cedar Mountain. Uh, the state of Virginia, the Department of, Pub of Historic Resources, and the state park system want to have a state park within an hour's drive or, 30 or 50 miles of everybody in Virginia. And in the, in the middle of central Virginia, in Culpeper County, there was this huge hole. So we've been trying since 2014 to get this done. Our, our local state representatives are all behind this. The county, county supervisors are all behind this. But every year, we get line item down. Every year, we get line item out. And so last year, during the, president, with the, the governor's election, Governor Glenn Youngkin, a couple people from the valley uh, with very deep pockets said, we're going to contribute a significant amount of money to your campaign. And this is what we want. $4.95 million to purchase the property, and what I love better is $3 million for more than, more than 800 more acres of purchase. There's already 2,100 acres on these, two, on these two properties. We're set to open in July 2024. There's still lots of unknowns. Don't know who is going to staff it and how it's going to staff it, so if you know buddy, somebody who wants to be a state park ranger, I, I got a job. There's two friends groups. We don't know how those are going to react together. There's an organization called Culpeper Battlefields. We don't know how they're going to play. Uh, there's lots of small organizations in Culpeper. We don't know what their role is going to be. There's modern structures. What do you do with the modern structures on a, on a, on a, on a battlefield? Do you tear them down? Or do you use them for state ma the maintenance guys and the staffing? You see? Yeah. So we, we didn't want them to tear these things down when we got them. And that's exactly why. And then the Brainy Station Foundation actually has some property. And we don't know what's going to happen with them, how they're going to, how they're going to transfer that over yet. All this land, that 2,100 acres, is owned by you. 
because the American Battlefield Trust owns it, and you can walk out there today. And that is what's really cool. All right, let's see if I can keep my fingers still the whole time. Real quickly, these are some of the things, you know, that's some of the land at Cedar Mountain today. Uh, that land up there, it says under easement, but the two properties on this side of the road are already ours, and we're working on that, that next one, so that's another 100 acres coming our way. So you can have primitive camping out there. If you want to camp like a soldier did, we can put, you can put up a tent. We can build, they're talking about building winter, winter style huts so you can camp like a real soldier did. They're talking about glam camping. Uh, a lot of trails here, uh, a lot of parking. Down at C, uh, Brandy Station, as I mentioned, it was the largest cavalry fight. This is gonna be fun. Uh, uh, it, was a, it was a cavalry fight. We're gonna have horse trails, horses out there. We have access to the Hazel River and the Rappahannock River. This is gonna be canoeing and tubing. And there's actually other properties uh, farther downstream that the trust and other people own that there's gonna be accessible so you can hop in down the Hazel River, float down the river and get out, excuse me, and get out. So there's gonna be a lot of great opportunities out here uh, for things to come in July, July 4th, 2024. And it's also, it's evolving and changing. Uh, this is June 28th. Uh, we put wayside markers in, interpreting the battlefield for the day hikers. Uh, we put seven signs up there, and last summer they said, well, we're gonna redo the signs at, at Brand New Station, and I said, well, let's redo the signs at Cedar Mountain, too. And they said, well, how many you got? I said, we got seven. They said, oh yeah, we can put that into budget. And I said, okay, seven. Can I have two more? <laughs> you see, there's four. I said, I have two more? And they said, because we haven't talked about some of these parts of the field, we want to interpret it. And they said, okay, Mike, yeah, four. And I said, okay, how about two more? <laughs> <laughs> so we installed 11, and I'm going to talk about this part of the field. When, I, when you hear me talk about Gordon's attack and the 33rd Virginia and the Stonewall Brigade are way up here on this hill right here, Gordon's men are down in that lower ground down there. So how do you think it's going to turn out for them? Spoiler alert, it's not going to be good. And then we got one more coming. We got one more sign coming because Culpeper Tourism asked me to do another sign. They said, we want another sign out there, but we really don't want something about the battle, but it's gotta be about the battle because we understand it's about the battle. And I said, okay. Well, I've got documentation of four dogs on the battlefield that day, and I've got photos of two. And they said, we like that. So one of my projects the rest of this month when I get back is to draw, uh, set up another wayside uh, for some more signs coming in. So these are living, these are living pieces of ground. Uh, you can come out and hike them and walk them and uh, see, actually Cedar Mountain's a great spot to watch meteor showers. I've done that many times. So, so that's, that's really what happens with, this, with, a, with a living, breathing uh, piece of primary source. All right, let's get into what we're really here for. Uh, okay. I'm trying the different buttons to see how they work, and they don't. That's okay. This is going to be fun. All right. I was not there in 1862. My granddaughters think I was, uh, but I'm not. So I do precision guesswork based on unreliable data provided by those of questionable knowledge. I have to take for granted what these guys said 160 years ago as the gospel. Do I believe all of it? Absolutely not. But that's your foundation. That's where you start, and that's where we start to tell the story. So the story of Cedar Mountain, the story of any work that a public historian does is based on, thank you, is based on really what, we, what the data we have. And as he mentioned, I love letters because those were written within a couple days after an event. And it's the most important thing on your mind that day after you tell me about the weather and how you're feeling. You're telling me what's going on because that's all the letters talk about. You can slide that over next to you now so you don't have to stretch all day. This is my, this is my assistant, and I, and I appreciate it. So, so we're going to go through some photos of some of the people that were involved in this. Stonewall Jackson, of course, on the right, and John Pope, the commander of the Army of Virginia, on your left. And I like this photo because this is John Pope in his Egyptian phase. He's got that pharaoh's beard going there. Uh, Pope, Pope is a Republican. George McClellan was not. He was the other big Army commander. Uh, he is a friend of Abraham Lincoln. He, went, he came east on the train from uh, Illinois on Lincoln's inaugural train. So he came through Batavia because the train came, I learned today the train came through Batavia. Uh, 
His father was a judge on Lincoln's, uh, in Lincoln's circuit as, as Lincoln was doing his thing as a lawyer. And so Lincoln trusts Pope and his military knowledge. He has come from the West where he's had some minor military successes. And again, he's a Republican. And that's what Lincoln wants. He wants a Republican to help him help prosecute this war. Under, under Pope, go ahead. Under Pope, he's got three corps. Uh, the second corps is the only one that fought at, at Cedar Mountain. And this is the uh, cast of characters involved there. Nathaniel Banks was the, was the corps commander with the divisions of Christopher Auger and Alphios Williams. Uh, under him, there's, there were five brigades, John Geary, Henry Prince, George Sears Green, Wyatt Samuel Crawford, and George Gordon. This is not a photo of a Union Army facial hair contest, <laughs> even though it could be, because all these guys have got some stuff going there. Uh, different times. On the other side, go ahead. You're just flying right along. I like this. I don't have to say that anymore. So Stonewall Jackson is going to with him, bring with him three different divisions to the battle. Two of the divisional commanders, Charles Winder up here on one side and Richard Ewell on the other and, his, and their three brigade commanders, uh, Thomas Garnett, William Tolliver and Charles Ronald. Charles Ronald was in charge of the Stonewall Brigade. This is the only action he's going to be in as the commander of the Stonewall Brigade. and He's going to do such a poor job. He's not going to be there. He's not going to be there for him two weeks later or three weeks later at the, at the Battle of Second Manassas or Second Bull Run. Uh, and he's such a popular guy. There's no photo of him available. So that's why we have, that's why we have uh, the stone. Jubal Early uh, is going to be fighting uh, mostly on the ground. Isaac Trimble and Henry Forno are going to be a place called the Shelf up on the mountain. So Early's going to be on the ground fighting. And, and the other division we have is under Ambrose Powell Hill. He's a Culpeper boy. Uh, he is in the news again today because when he died and they eventually found a final resting place for him, they put him in the monument to A.P. Hill on Monument Avenue in Richmond. So his bones are interred there. Now when everything happened in Richmond in the last year or so and they tore down all the monuments, they can't tear down his monument because that's where he's buried. So they're trying to figure out what to do with that and I think the answer is going to be within a couple of years he's going to end up being buried in Culpeper because he's a Culpeper native. So he has seven brigades with him. And you see photos of six uh, of, of his cast of characters. There was one guy by the name of Macy Gregg, South Carolinian, had a brigade of South Carolina guys. And uh, stuff, the movement north was so tough for Jackson, I'm going to talk about this, that Gregg was detached, his whole brigade, four regiments of infantry, protect a ford along the road. So they knew they had a way out. So that's why Macy Gregg wasn't there. Go ahead. This is the situation in... <coughs> Second week of July, 1862. Let's see if we have a pointer. Hey, look, look, look. So Lee's down here in Richmond. He's got McClellan backed up to uh, Harrison's Landing. That's a good thing. Uh, he's worried about what's keeping him awake at night is Ambrose Burnside. Yes, the guy from Fredericksburg, Ambrose Burnside. He's, he doesn't know. He's coming up from North Carolina with basically two divisions. He doesn't know where he's going to land. And because he doesn't know where he's going to land, he cannot really send Jackson, who's in central Virginia, any farther. Jackson's at a place called Louisa Courthouse, which is on the Virginia Central Railroad. Where Lee wants him is in Gordonsville, because that's where the Orange and Alexandria and the Virginia Central meet. That's going to be Pope's objective. Until Burnside, they figure out where Burnside lands, Jackson's got to stay put. Burnside could join McClellan and build up that force there, and again, create another threat and possibly another campaign against the eastern side of Richmond. Or he can continue down the James a little bit and land at the Bermuda 100 area or even at Petersburg and threaten Richmond from the south, which would force Lee to be fighting on two fronts. Or he could go up to Fredericksburg right here and start moving south. Again, it becomes a two front war. Uh, he's already got enough problems with John Pope's army forming up here. And I'll talk about that in a second. Fortunately for Lee, Burnside's going to land way down at the bottom here at Fort Monroe, hang out there for a couple weeks, and end up all the way up at Aquia Landing, and eventually he's going to go west. So Burnside's not going to be a threat. Jackson only has to start with those two divisions under Ewell and Charles Winder, the ones he detaches to send out there. Jackson is not part of the Army in Northern Virginia at this time. He is still the commander of the Army of the Valley District. 
He's working with Lee. You don't hear about the Union armies working together. Lee and Jackson are working together. They have a common cause. And what Lee wants to do is repeat the 1862 Valley Campaign. If you, if you know a little bit about your Civil War history, what's happened in the spring of 1862 is that when McClellan lands here and starts moving his way up the, up the peninsula, there was, a, there was a core here in Fredericksburg and then Banks Siegel and a guy named John Fremont were running around the valley. Well, those guys could figure out a way to come down close to Richmond. Again, Lee would have to be fighting on multiple fronts. He didn't want that. So he sent Jackson out to the valley to run around to beat up on Banks, Siegel, and Fremont, which he did to great, to great success, uh, which forced Mc, McDowell to stay there or, and go, or go over to the valley and come back. Those guys never played a role in the Richmond campaign. That's what, that's what made Jackson's Valley Campaign a success, is he kept all those armies occupied. Again, he's going against B and C level leaders as opposed to Stonewall Jackson, so they're not gonna be very good. This is what's happening again in late July. These, when John Pope came east, the Army of Virginia, which he created, was formed under Banks, Siegel, and, and Irwin McDowell. Siegel has replaced John Fremont, so that's, who, that's, that's, that's the same. They're the same guys and Jackson's being sent again to do the same job. The critical point, again, is Gordonsville. But until Jackson can get another division, that eventual division of A.P. Hill, he doesn't have that offensive punch to go after Pope. And for a variety of reasons, uh, yeah, you're good. And for a variety of reasons, Jackson's gonna get the division of A.P. Hill. And the bottom line in all this was A.P. Hill and James Longstreet two of Lee's most trusted commanders got into a verbal tiff after the Seven Days campaign about some of the newspaper stories. And they started arguing back and forth. And their staff started arguing back and forth. And then they wouldn't talk to each other at all. And then they started exchanging notes because we're gonna set up a duel now between James Longstreet and A.P. Hill, which is the absolute last thing that Robert E. Lee needs is to have two of his leaders, two of his most critical, successful leaders whacking themselves on a 7, 7 a.m. in the morning out in the field with a couple pistols. So, so he got the boys separated, uh, and, he, and he cut, cut A.P. Hill to Jackson's, Jackson's army. And in the note he sends to Jackson saying, this is happening, he says, in Hill you can trust and rely on. Counsel with him, talk with him, communicate with him, and, you'll, and there'll be success. How many people know about how many times Jackson communicated with his staff? Yeah. Once. He never did it again. So guess how this is going to work out for Stonewall Jackson. So everybody's got a plan. The original plan for Pope, of course, once he got his army together, was to come down, assault Gordonsville, threaten Charlottesville, and go into the back door of Richmond. First to maybe fight Lee on two sides, but as McClellan got kicked back into, onto Harrison's landing, it was to occupy Lee's attention so McClellan can actually get away. McClellan's not actually going to leave until the battle is over. Uh, advance to Culpeper, then again the maneuver to Gordonsville. Gordonsville is the second largest rail center in Virginia in 1862. This is a critical spot. All the food from the valley comes through here. The line turns in, in the valley and goes south into Tennessee. Tennessee is still Confederate, Confederate territory in the summer of 1862. So food and supplies are coming up that way as well. We gotta hold Gordonsville. So we get, we get to Gordonsville under, under Pope, and then we're gonna, we're gonna make, make, a, make a left turn and go into the back door of Richmond. That's the plan. He stays, in, he stays into, into DC until July 29th because Lincoln doesn't wanna let him go. I need your advice, I need you to stay here. I need to know what McClellan is saying in all these stupid messages and telegrams that are coming up all day. So McClellan doesn't join his army for over a month after he assumes command. And once he goes out there, all his fun happens. Jackson's orders are very simple. Protect the rail junction at Gordonsville. Gotta be happy, gotta do it. And once we know where Burnside is, he's gonna move to Gordonsville and eventually up to Orange Courthouse. And we'll show you that in a slide or two. And then Lee says, if you get a chance, I want Pope suppressed. Punch him in the nose, stop his momentum, change the initiative, change that initiative but don't get too far away from Richmond because I may need you. So those are Jackson's orders, and those are Pope's orders. So in the middle of July, Crawford 
was ordered down to Culpeper Courthouse to support the Federal Cavalry operations under George Bayard and a man named John Hatch. John Hatch uh, was put in charge of two different raids into Orange and Albemarle County, which are in southern, south central Virginia. Failed miserably in both of those. The second time it was so bad that he ran into some skirmishers and retreated. I got, I got, I got one of these. He, he retreated uh, from the Liberty Mills area through Ruckersville over the mountains into the Shenandoah Valley and went all the way up the Shenandoah Valley to Sperryville before he came back across the Blue Ridge Mountains. And John Pope says, you're gone. You're gone. He made him an infantry commander. And he, he brought this guy out from the st a staff position in Washington, D.C. by the name of John Buford. Probably the best decision John Pope made in the entire war. John, John Buford was the, probably the, the premier division level cavalry commander the Federals ever had. If George Bayard had survived, and he's going to die, spoiler alert, he's going to die at Fredericksburg in December, those two would have really, really made a difference in the East. So Crawford's down there supporting him. In the month of July, George Bayard primarily is running all up and down in this area here and farther point south down into, down into Gordonsville area in Barbersville, scouting, skirmishing, getting a read on how many people Jackson has with them and where they are. And it's given Jackson fits. His cavalry is completely ineffective against anything George Bayard's doing. The other thing that, that Pope has done is he set up signal stations on the high ground along this area here. And he's got one up at Thoroughfare Mountain. Thoroughfare Mountain can see into Orange Courthouse. So as soon as Jackson starts doing something, the flags start waving and we know what's going on. And it gets to the point where they're waving flags and at nighttime you can't see flags so you wave torches. Well unfortunately, the other guys can see torches too. And, and the Confederates send some troops up there to kind of, kind of take out that signal station. The, the signal guys see them coming and says, oh, we're not hanging around here. Hey, they're coming, we're gone. They go, hiding in the, they, go, they go hiding on the mountain, the Confederates look for them, and by the time a relief column comes with another signal crew and a regiment of infantry to protect, protect them, the lieutenant by the name of George Spencer's back up there doing his thing again. And they're gonna stay up there until the second Manassas campaign. So the eyes, the eyes and ears of, of Pope are significantly better than Stonewall Jackson. Go back, I'm not done yet. That's okay, that's okay. So. Yeah, he's doing good. So August 6th, Pope gives the orders, we're gonna start moving south now. Here's our plan. This division under Ricketts is gonna move from a place called Waterloo Bridge, west of Warrington, come down this road here, and they're gonna end up at a place called Culverns Tavern right there. Banks is gonna leave from Washington, little Washington today, get on the, get on the uh, Shenandoah Parkway, essentially 211, and get up to Sperryville, go on 522, today's 522, road's still there, march down to Culpeper, Franz Siegel's gonna follow him. The plan is to get everybody down here in Culpeper and then again, move against Gordonsville. That's the plan. Jackson sees this, because he does have scouts and some spies out there, sees it coming. And so on the evening of August 7th, he issues a series of orders to start the march to strike at Pope before he can gather and concentrate in Culpeper. So on the evening of August 7th, Yule is, is west of town at a place called Somerset at a house called Frascati. He's camped around there. Winder and Hill are camped just south of Orange Courthouse. So Jackson sends out these orders. Yule, you go first. You get on the road from Montpelier, because Montpelier was still there at the time. Come into Orange, hang a left at the courthouse. There. That's where the courthouse is. Go past the McDonald's, it's right next to the McDonald's, and go up the road, cross the Barnett's Ford, and then go, over, go into Culpeper. AP Hill? You're the new guy in the Corps, we're gonna put you in the middle because you've also got the largest division. He's got 9,000 guys. He, br he, brings, he brings Jackson's total up to 22, 23,000 guys. So Jackson can probably punch somebody if he gets that opportunity. You go second, and then Charles Winder, you go third. Got it, boss. This is A.P. Hill's first day marching with Stonewall Jackson. So, at dawn, A.P. Hill's guys, guys all lined up, ready to go. We're gonna march with Stonewall Jackson. This is gonna be great. And some guys start going by. Okay, that's right, there's supposed to be guys going by. I'm new to the army, I don't know everybody yet. And after a little while, he figures out it's Winder and not Yule. So what are you gonna do? Well, Yule 
got orders from Jackson after he sent out those initial set of orders and said, you know what, I got a better route for you. Why don't you just come up here to the river and move along the river and cross at Barnett's Ford, and that way you can avoid Orange and all that congestion with everybody else. Does he tell Hill? Does he tell Winder? No. So there's A.P. Hill on his first day marching with Stonewall Jackson. Oh, and he's got Charles Winder going past them. Stonewall Jackson and A.P. Hill got into a tiff at West Point, but they have a professional relationship until about 7 a.m. on August 8th. After that, it just didn't exist anymore. Jack Hill said, well, I could cut in front of his infantry. No, it won't work. I'll wait till all the infantry passes and get in front of his, his artillery and wagons. No, I better wait till everybody's gone and I'll just come in behind him. It's at that point that Jackson rides up and both of those men are seethingly angry at each other. And Jackson rides off on a huff and Hill rides off on a huff and they, never, and, and they just don't talk. They talk very only about something that they have to talk about until Jackson dies, really, in May of next year. So, the good news is, we've got, at least we're worked out now, because Yule's marching, right? And he's, he's in good shape, and we've got Winder in the middle, and Hill's last. Well, the problem is, when you get to Barnett's Ford, right here, there's Federal Cavalry and skirmish with them, slows them down, and, the, they're, and they're gonna spend the day of August 8th skirmishing with Federal Cavalry every step of the way. Cavalry will deploy on a hill, 20, 40 guys, here comes the infantry, bang, 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 infantry's guys saying, oh fine, not again. Get off the column of the road, get in the column of the field, go up the field and chase them off the hill, get back in your column and move down to the next hill and the guys are back again, hey, we're still here, next hill. And that's what they did all the way up. The other problem is, is that Yule's got a huge wagon train. And we're not going across bridges at Barnett's Ford, we're going down the, down the dirt road, into the water, and up the dirt road going out. How do you think that works with a division of infantry? Yule had 6,000 guys, all those wagons, all those horses. What do you think that, that's, that bank that they're going up is like? Exactly. Nobody's going anywhere. By the end of the night, by August 8th, night of August 8th, Yule has marched from Somerset to Barnett's Ford and gets up to a place called Crooked Run Baptist Church. He is, still five, he is still 11 miles from Culpeper and five miles from the eventual battlefield. Charles Winder behind him gets to Dr. Slaughter's house, which is about a mile from the Ford. A.P. Hill marches through town, wondering what the hell's going on, rides up to the Ford, sees what's going on, and turns his men around. A.P. Hill marches one mile that's Jackson's foot cavalry on August 8, 1862, the absolute worst day he has marching. To compound this, the temperature's in the 90s, and we're wearing wool, and we're carrying how many pounds of gear? 40 pounds of gear. And we're not stopping for water because we can't let everyone stop and fill up their canteen of water. Men are dying of sunstroke on this march just to get to a battle. They're dying of sun soap. Now the Federal Army, coming from Washington and Sperryville, they're having the same problems. As a matter of fact, they're gonna march at night because it's smart. You're not marching in the heat of the day, right? Well, you're still marching and you're stopping and you're starting and it's hot still because the temperature doesn't go down in August in, in, in Virginia. And so you're sitting there going <sighs> And so you're breathing in all that dust. And that's just making things that much worse because you can't even see the dust. So both armies have a miserable, miserable march going up there. It's going to get so bad that Jackson's going to write to Lee and say, I'm not making progress. I don't think I'm going to do any good. Okay, now we can do that. So we know see, uh, Banks's, Banks's Corps is going to reach the outskirts of Culpeper on the evening of August 8th. So they're going to be about seven miles from the eventual battlefield also. Franz Siegel, when he gets his orders on that, fi on that one road, sends a note to Pope saying, okay, I'll march from Sperryville to Culpeper. What road do you want me to use to get there? There's one road. And Pope is beside himself and says, there's only one road. And the message goes back, there's only one road. Take the one road. And so Siegel starts marching. He's gonna get, he's gonna get to Culpeper in the evening of August 9th after the battle's over. Pope, Pope says, I need you to get to the field now. And Siegel's gonna say, well, I, I would boss, but 
besides not knowing what road to take, I also didn't follow your orders and get my men rations prepared before we left. And so they've marched and they're hungry. And so we're going to cook rations. We're going to eat before we go to the battle. <laughs> this is what Pope is dealing with. So August 9th, the day of the battle, it's a Saturday. Again, it's in, the temperature is going to be in the 90s. This is day five. This is day six of nine days of 90 degree plus heat that these guys are dealing with. Uh, the night of the 8th, the Federal Cavalry under Bayard has, has formed themselves at the, on the southern end of the road from Orange Courthouse to Culpeper. First Pennsylvania, first New Jersey, first Rhode Island are, are, are across the fields where the battle's going to take place. The first Maine is on that right flank. And you can read from uh, Henry Pine, first New Jersey Cavalry uh, chaplain, wrote the, wrote, wrote the history. I love this, I love this last paragraph. The same and different talking, eating and drinking was going on, which characterized a normal, normal halt. There goes the artillery. Oh, we don't care. Look, there goes our rabbit. And we're going to watch the rabbit. And so as the army start to gather on the field in the morning and early afternoon, these, these three cavalry regiments are sitting there slowing down the process again. And finally, Jubal Early gets the orders to get off the road, swing around these woods that you can see up there, and clear these guys out which he does, and that's really what initiates the battle about 1.32 o'clock in the afternoon of, of August 9th. How hot is it in August, 1.32 o'clock? Yeah, okay, we don't need to talk about that anymore. Go back one more real quick, I'm almost done. You're, good. You're doing good, you really are. While Early is moving, the other two divisions under Yule, Isaac Trimble and Henry Forno, are going up a side of a mountain, Cedar Mountain, but the battle gets its name, and we're gonna be in a position up there and occupy the high ground. Going with them is a man named Joseph Latimer and some guns. Now you can change the slide. Here's Joe Latimer. I want to know what you guys were doing when you were 18. Were you leading a division of artillery in, a, in an army? That's what he was doing. New captain, he's the chief of artillery. He is going to take his guns, his, his battery that he also commands, plus two other guns, and go along, cut along a road along the base of the hill and up the side of the hill and get into position on a place called the Shelf. It's about 160 feet above the battlefield, and with two brigades of infantry protecting you, you're in a pretty good spot, and you're gonna have a good day up there. He gets up there, and he goes ahead of his men, goes ahead of the battery with his gunners, the guy that's actually gonna be firing the guns. And they get up there, and they, they find a spot where they can set up these guns, and then they've carried their fuses with them, because you cut the fuses to see how far those cannons, those shells will fly before they, they, they pop off. And so he's up there, and so he's got his fuses cut for the, where the different batteries are and where he can see infantry forming out in the fields there. And so when his gunners get up there, they're ready to go. This is going to be the best position on this hill that anybody in the uh, Confederate Army in the East is going to have throughout the entire war. Uh, the bad news in all this was uh, Reverend Slaughter, and it was also called Slaughter Mountain. Uh, he had his home up there. Uh, over a thousand books were scattered about the yard, and one Geor Georgian commented, classics in Greek, Latin, French were mingled, ironically, with Longfellow and Whittier. Now, I can't find any evidence that the Federals were up there before the battle. So I don't know who trashed his library, but somebody trashed his library. There's two significant injuries for the Confederates during this battle, and they both happened very early in the fight. First one is Charles Winder. Again, he is Jackson's, he, he's, he's commanding Jackson's old Stonewall Division. He is a kind of a protege of Jackson. He is like Jackson. He doesn't like telling people what's going on. You go over here and we're going to take care of that. Uh, he's a martinet, so his men don't like him. Uh, one one uh, account uh, from, a, from a private in the 21st Virginia states that in the next battle, Winder will probably die and we don't know where the bullet's going to come from. So, so you think about fragging in Vietnam, it was going on, it was going on here. Well, in the heat of a battle, some people, as I like to say, go back to their lowest common denominator. What do they know best? What do they do best? It happened to John Reynolds at Fredericksburg. It happens to Winder here. He's an artillerist at heart. And so as he's moving his division forward along this road near a place called the Crittenden Gate, some artillery has come up into those positions there and is firing onto the federal artillery on the other side of the field. The first three hours of the fight is just, it's just artillery going back and forth where everyone's trying to move into place. 
So he's out here trying to move his men into place and running over to the guns, helping aim the guns and fire the guns because obviously the battery commander and the, and the gun crews don't know what they're doing, so he's gonna do it for them. And in the midst of all this, he leans over to tell somebody something and a piece of shell goes right through him, like that, just like that. And he's gonna linger for about two hours before he dies and he's gonna be conscious and he's gonna be coherent. So that was our last two hours for Charles Winder. Charles Winder is gonna be the only Confederate general to die in Culpeper County during the war. Uh, he's replaced by a man named William Tolliver, a brigade commander, and Tolliver saying, what's going on here? No one knows because the orders weren't dismissed. So he has to ride around to the other brigades to figure out what is going on. And we're gonna talk about Garnett in a couple of minutes, and that's where he's gonna end up out there. The other injury comes from Snowden Andrews, go ahead. And that's our Snowden Andrews, and he was, uh, he was a battalion artillery commander. He's got three batteries that he's kind of managing. Uh, smart guy, popular guy. And he realizes that where these guns are at this place called the Crittenden Gate is not a place to be because all the artillery is flying there. So we're gonna disperse you. We're gonna send one battery down the road this way. And we're gonna send a couple other batteries up on a slope over here where it's safe. And so he rides up to the top of this slope and gets these guys in place. And as he's getting the guys in place, a piece of shrapnel goes off, cuts them right across the stomach. He has the wherewithal, I'm sorry you've had dinner, got to talk about it. He has the wherewithal to grab onto his intestines that are coming out, fall off his horse on his back, keeping his, arm, his hands there, keeping everything in place. A couple doctors come up and say, good to know you, buddy. <laughs> and he says, well, what's my chances? They said, you know, one in a hundred. And he, and he goes off, and according to the account, I had a damn dog once that had his guts rowed up, riding, a, jumping across the fence, chasing a fox. And I know I'm damn well better than a, better than a fox, so I'm gonna, or my dog, so I'm going to take that chance. And the line is, there's more grit in him than on him. He is put in a wagon, taken on a six-mile ride in that wagon to that house where he's operated on. He survives that operation. His wife is from Baltimore, in Baltimore, with, I think she has six kids. One of them is still being breastfed. She comes through the lines. One of Pope's staffers, a man named Louis Marshall, the nephew of Robert E. Lee, gives her a pass, puts her in a wagon, because wagons have springs, best kind of ride you got, and that wagon is also stocked with medicine. So she's in the ambulance, goes down. He recovers. He's going to be wounded. He's going to get back, in, back into the war. He's going to be wounded again the following June in a place called Stevenson Depot. The Confederates say, you're done. We're going to send you to Europe to buy arms for us. So he goes over to Germany. And in 1864, the German states and Denmark are trying to get ready to have a war. And so he says, well, I'm going to go check this out. And they say, it's too dangerous. And he, from, according to the account, he opens up his blouse and says, really? Too dangerous? Look at these scars. And they say, well, okay, fine. And he goes, he goes out there and he, and he observes this, this war. After the war, he goes back to Canada because he's an unconstructed rebel. He eventually comes back to, he eventually comes back to Baltimore. He is going to be, he's an architect, so he's gonna build a new wing on the US Treasury Building. He is going to build the Annapolis State House and an asylum. Not too bad for a guy that almost got his guts ripped open. Again, you guys all have to go to work tomorrow if you do that kind of stuff. This is the guy that starts the Battle of Cedar Mountain, and he didn't fire a shot. His name is Henry Palouse. He is a staffer on Banks's, he's a staff officer for Nathaniel Banks, and he's the guy that gets the verbal orders, verbal orders from John Pope. According to Pope, Pope says, go form up on a good defensive position, send out your skirmishers, and if the skirmishers engage, hold your position until the army comes up. What Palouse tells Banks is, get in a good position, send out your skirmishers. If they become engaged, go ahead and engage the enemy. I mentioned that Jackson has 22,000 guys with him. Banks has 9,000 guys. How's this gonna work out for Nathaniel Banks today? We'll get to that. Palouse claims that he wrote down the orders, and in 1865, in a little notebook I found in Nathaniel Banks' papers in the Library of Congress, 
there's, there's, the, there's, the, uh, there's the transcription of, from Henry Palouse's notebooks to Nathaniel Banks saying that's what exactly what it was. John Pope and everybody on Pope's staff says that's not the case. Everyone on Banks says absolutely it was. Now you've got to think about Nathaniel Banks for a second. He's had his butt kicked up and down the valley. He's nicknamed Commissary Banks by the Confederates because they take his wagons and his food. He's looking at the battlefield this day and he sees some guys up on a hill over here. He sees some artillery and some guys and some trees in front of him. And he thinks he sees some guys and some trees over here. There's 300 yards between these guys and there's over 200 yards between these guys and the guys in the valley early down below. And then those guys are up there who, if I fight, if I start a fight down here, those guys aren't going to play because they can't get down. So he's thinking, I got a chance. And he's going to take that chance and initiate an attack. Unfortunately for 1862, when these attacks take place, they are not coordinated. So those five brigades under Nathaniel Banks are going to make four separate attacks. The fifth under George Sears Green is going to hold his position and protect that, protect the, uh, the Confederate left, or the Federal left flank. Everyone else is going to make an attack. Should they go on off at the same time and maybe something would have happened? Yes. Did that happen? Absolutely not. So, Augur's division is going to step off first. Uh, John Geary's men, they're all four Ohio, Ohio regiments, are already 400 yards in advance in a, in a culvert and they step off using the Culpeper Road right there. As their, right, as their right flank. So they're going to march along the road so they can keep everybody in line in order. The problem is those guys that they thought they saw out there was a brigade of Confederate infantry in some trees on a hill along the road. And for the most part these guys are away from the road because they don't want to show themselves. But they've got a couple guys down at the tree line. They're watching out and say, oh look, here comes a bunch of guys in blue. Let's take them. So as they advance along the road, here they come. The Confederates come up and say, thank you very much, and start firing into their flanks. And at the same time, this brigade down here, about 300 yards away, starts firing into their front. And the Ohio Brigade is just going to be torn up before it's all done. I'll talk about some numbers from them in a second. Also going out with them are the 8th and 12th U.S. Infantry, regulars. This is the 12th Infantry's first fight. These two battalions, they're battalion size, so they're smaller than a regiment, probably 300 guys total in these, two, in these two groups are going to out in front and they're going to act as skirmishers. One man in particular I'm going to talk about in a couple of minutes is going to win a Medal of Honor out there. Prince sees these guys going on, moving forward and he goes, well crap, I guess we better get going here. So he's going to step off and as you can see his lines are not perfectly even. There's some guys out in front of them and a little off to the right. That's the 3rd Maryland and the 109th Pennsylvania. There's New Yorkers and Pennsylvanians behind him. As they step off, Prince tells the guys in back, remember, there's guys in front of you off to your right. We got it, boss. We're okay. You can see where this is going. They fire the first volley. Okay, cool. They fire the second guy. Oh, there's somebody in the trees over there. And they, and they fire into the rear of the Federals. Those guys break and run. The guys behind them see what's going on. They break and run. So Prince's brigade gets about 200 yards into a cornfield. They break and retreat. Fortunately for Prince, he had his leaders find a spot to rally on and they're actually going to rally and move forward again to the point where they will push early off his position. Thomas is the 1st Brigade in A.P. Hill's division and because of the pressure that Prince is putting on early, is detached from going over to the Confederate left and has to go over to the right and he's going to spend the battle at the base of the mountain protecting, protecting Jubal early. Here's some of the casualties from the Ohio, the Ohio guys. Those four regiments lost 464 men, mostly killed and wounded. Look at the missing, 19 missing. When we talk about Crawford's Brigade, you're going to see a significantly different, different number. The Ohio guys are fighting in corn. They're fighting guys off on their, on their right flank and in their front. They use the corn as protection. How much is corn can protect you with bullets? But they step into the corn, kind of out of sight. They'll step out of the corn, fire their volleys, and fall back into the, into the corn. That's what they did for most of the fight. They stood there and took on that fight until the orders came to retreat. 
And that was later in the fight. You can see some of these quotes. <coughs> when the order came to retreat, Lieutenant Mervyn Clark mistook the order to charge with a dozen men. How do you mistake a charge and retreat? He did. And they go charging out in the field. Dashed at a double line of whole brigade of rebels. He dashed against Tolliver guys. Someone had to go out there and get those guys and get them back. <laughs> it was bad. There was one man there by the name of George Lantham. And I want to say he was in the 66th Ohio. And he is seen coming back off the field. And they're thinking, what's, what's up with this guy? He doesn't look like he's hurt. And as they get close to, the, to a newspaper correspondent who's documenting this, he can see that he's had these two fingers shot off. Well, that's what you need to fire. So he gets back there, and these guys start bandaging him up, and he's talking about how this, was, this, this finger wasn't very important, but this one really was, and he really is going to miss this finger. And he gets it bandaged up, and he, and he turns to go back to the battle, and he stops, and he hands his, hands his gun to this correspondent and said, would you reload this for me? George Townsend, the correspondent, reloads the gun, and the guy goes back into the fight. Well, George Lantham doesn't survive the battle. He dies from that injury a couple, three days after the battle. And he's one of, I think, six known Federals to have died at the Battle of Cedar Mountain that are buried in the National Cemetery. Every other Cedar Mountain burial in there is an unknown man. But George Lantham, you can find him today. He is right next to the, uh, next to the Ohio Monument in the valley, or in the, in the cemetery. So, after Augur kicks off, about 15 minutes later, Samuel Crawford Brigade starts moving forward. Now Crawford's up in the trees on top of a hill, and he's waiting for word from Banks to advance. And he sees Geary's men going forward and Prince's men going forward, and we say, well, crap. So he starts bringing his men down the hill, out of these trees, over a fence, into a freshly cut wheat field. That, that wheat field, that, that cut wheat field, is downhill, to a dry creek at the bottom, and back uphill to a slope probably yeah, like this, and that's where the Confederates are, and that's where he's going after. He has four regiments, only three are in the advance, the 5th Connecticut, the 28th New York, and the, and the 46th Pennsylvania. Their fourth regiment, the largest one, 10th Maine, Banks is keeping as an infantry reserve in case something goes wrong, and they'll get used this day. So he's only going, he's only going with three of his four, four tools in his box. As he advances, he sees some guys from Gordon's Brigade acting as skirmishers, about, 100, about 160 guys from the 3rd Wisconsin. And he says, come on, join us. We're going to have fun. We're going to whoop on the Confederates. Colonel Crane says, well, I've got to go talk to my dad first. He's got to go to my brigade commander. Goes back and talks to his brigade commander. And by the time he gets the word to go forward, he is five to 10 minutes behind Crawford. And here's 160 guys going across an open field. And they're going to be attacked in the flank. And in two minutes, have 116 casualties, and they're going to retreat. So it's three separate attacks. Uh, go forward two. We're going to come back to the Medal of Honor guys. And this is what the attack looks like. The 5th Connecticut is going right up against the top of that point. They came down out of the trees into this wheat field and up this steep slope and right into the 42nd and the 48th, 48th uh, Virginia. And they're going to get bounced along there. Uh, their color bearers are going to lose seven color bearers that day. Their casualties are going to be harassed. They're going to stay that fight right in that general area there. Garnett's brigade is in an L shape of the 21st, the 48th at a corner, the 42nd, and the 1st Virginia Battalion. 1st Virginia Battalion is a small battalion of guys. In 1862, this is all woods. Right here is a ravine. Right here is a ravine. And you can see by the nice blue lines, there's nobody there to stop them. According to the uh, after action report of the 1st Virginia Battalion, they see the 28th New York come down the slope. They fire shots over their heads. They fire again over their heads. By this time, they're coming up the slope. They fire a shot over their heads. The last time they fired, they actually hit somebody, but they have gone around the Confederate left and there's nobody there to stop them. Nobody there to stop them. So they're going to get into the trees and get behind the 42nd, the 48th, and they're going to actually engage the 21st Virginia 
and the 21st Virginia is having fun shooting the Geary's Ohio guys out this way, and all of a sudden they're getting literally shot and bayoneted in the back. That was our first indication there was a problem. <laughs> That's a problem. That's a problem. Uh, when Winder died and Tolliver went out to check on Garnett and see what's going on out here, he says, you got a problem, I'm bringing help. And he had detached one of his regiments, the 10th Virginia, from a position right about here. They went into the trees and were working their way forward. And that's about as far as they got when, when Crawford struck. They didn't know what hit them. They got, they got thrown back. And they got thrown back into the Stonewall Brigade. The 27th Virginia was on the right. And the 27th Virginia was out of the fight before they even got in. I think they, took, they suffered like 10 or 12 casualties the entire fight. They did not play. So it looks like things are going to go real good for the, for the federal guys if they can get reinforcements. Well, this is a civil war. It's early in the civil war. They're not going to get reinforcements. The 28th is again, it's going to sweep through. Within the 28th, go ahead to the next slide. This is the ground today that they advanced up. Put trees in it. It's a nice clear slope. The Confederates are on the other side of this ridge right here. They can't see them. The 10th Maine is in, or the 10th Virginia is in those trees over there. They can't see them. They get up into these trees, and there's trees here, and are going to get behind them. Go ahead. This is William Warren, uh, Company C, 28th New York. This is another reason why you need to go to work tomorrow. As he stepped off, he's going to take a round, take off the tip of his finger. Continues along, left arm gets shot. As he says in a post-war account, so spoiler alert, he survives. I've had 13 pieces of bone taken from it since. So he's got bones still coming out of it post-war. He's still going. He gets shot in the head. Covers his side of his face in blood. Uh, came, the ball came in sideways, passing out and carrying away a piece of my skull. That side of my face was covered in blood and the eye was blinded by the shot. I got up again to do what I could. It's three. We're keeping score here, that's three. Number four hits him right in the neck between the, between the carotid artery and the windpipe. It was a mini ball, so it's rifled, so it's spinning. So it pushed those two things apart and lodged in the back of his neck. There was a sharp pain, you think? <laughs> and then my head swelled, seemed to swell as big as a basket. And he kept going. Finally got shot in the legs, <clears throat> fell over in the wheat shock and was done for. Well, you think he was done for. The next day, he's laying out in the field and a Confederate, probably looking for some boots and other things, comes across to him, sees he's still alive, takes his oil skin, which is a waterproof kind of piece of canvas, stakes it to the ground and puts it over him so he's got shade from that sun. Nice guy. That night, it rains. So now we're laying in a shot, we're where, laying in a field, bleeding all over the place probably. Got shade and have water. He's going to survive the ride. He's going to be captured, survive the ride to Orange Courthouse, or, yeah, Orange Courthouse, put on a train to Richmond. I'm sure along the way he got bandaged up along the way. He gets paroled, he released from prison in November of 1862, gets out of the army at that point, goes back home. In May, he re-enlists in the 28th again because it's, it, it's the right thing to do because the regiment is a two-year regiment and we're going to muster out. So he wants to muster out with his guys. They're not fighting anymore. They all come back home, they all shake hands, and he musters out until the fall when he re-enlists in another regiment and goes out west and fights. Wounded two more times. The guy's a magnet. Now, that would be the end of the story until, until about three months ago I found a document. And it's written in Warren's hand, and it's from uh, December of 64, and he's out of the Army again, and he's writing a letter saying, I'm owed a pension of $400. He, saw, he, he originally signed on, I think, with one of the fifth, I think the fifth New York. And part of the deal with the 5th New York was, if you survived, you got a $400 pension. 
The problem was he left that regiment and joined the 28th, so contract null and void. So the lawyers get involved. So he writes this letter. He's got testimonies from everybody. It's a four-page document with saying, this is a cool guy. He got wounded four times. He really deserves this money. Yes, 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 yes. A board looks at it in Buffalo, looks at this letter and says, yep, $400 comes to you, William Warren. Here you go. What's he do with the money? Takes that $400 and pays off his lawyers. So what's he do after the war? He becomes a lawyer himself. 28th, go ahead and that one more slide. 28th New York, one company came from Batavia, Company F. Uh, in the unit, I don't know how many people were in Company F, but 339 went in action, 213 guys in that unit became casualties. That is close to 60%, 60% casualties. These are the guys in Company F, so 17, you figure there's about 40 to 50 guys in a company at this stage of the war. So 17 casualties, out of 50 guys, that's 35% casualties from one town. And those are some photos I found of some guys from Company F. All right, let's go back. We're going back to the Medal of Honor. Back, back, right there. I mentioned two Medal of Honors. The guy on the left is John Yonker, 12th U.S. Infantry. I was talking about him a little earlier. He's, he's from born in Germany, raised in Ohio, joins, joins the regulars goes out there, and he's out there on August 9th, and he's up near the front, and his captain says, John, I need you to go back and tell, tell, tell the artillery where we are so they don't fire on us. Got it, boss. He goes running across the field. They see him. They fire at him. He gets all the way back. He goes back and says, done, boss. Good. I need you to go back and do it again now because we've moved. He goes back again. He does that two times. The Confederate artillery, the Confederates were so... Uh, discombobulated by these federal skirmishers, that they're actually turning their artillery on these skirmishers who are scattered out about the fields. Uh, in, 19, in 1891, Yonker writes a nice little narrative about why he deserves a Medal of Honor and sends it off to get his Medal of Honor. Well, the problem is, is that you cannot nominate yourself for a Medal of Honor. Someone has to do it for you. And so he gets this nice letter saying, go away, you bother me. Find somebody who saw you do this and have them write it. Well, he does, and in, in November 1st, 18, or 1893, he's going to be awarded the Medal of Honor. Yonkers is also captured in the wilderness and spends over a year at Andersonville Prison. He is in the photo of Union soldiers burying Union dead at Andersonville, and he also testifies at the trial of Henry Wirtz. Goes back home. The other guy is another, another candidate for the uh, Facial Hair Award. Uh, his name is George Corliss and he is a captain in the 5th Connecticut, and he does not get along with his boss, George Chapman. So, Corliss is one of those seven guys who carries the flag of the 5th Main, or 5th Connecticut that day and gets shot in both legs. He survives the battle, he survives the war. He wants to, he wants to write up, write himself, get himself written up for a Medal of Honor, but Chapman won't have anything to do with it. So he waits until Chapman dies in the late 1880s, then he starts writing. And finally, he gets a notification that he's awarded the Medal of Honor, and it arrives in the mail. Because you didn't have these ceremonies with the president, it got sent in the mail. And it got sent to him on September 10th, 1897. And he's looking at it, and it's pretty cool, and he opens it up, and there it is. There's this beautiful Medal of Honor. You've got, you've got one on the other end, but you can go look at it. Then he turns it over, and his name's there. Spelled wrong. Back it up take it back to the UPS store, return it, <laughs> get a new one. He eventually got it done right. All right, so things are going, yep, things are going to pot for the Confederates right now. If there were some other Federals out there, something positive could have happened to them on August 9th, but there wasn't. Stonewall Jackson is at the far right of the line just kind of watching the battle. He's deaf in one ear like most artillerists, and he kind of cocks his ear in a funny way and he says, there's some serious work going on over there. And he starts racing across the field, just in time to see all those Confederates that Crawford's kicking their butts on, retreating back, the ones who can. And he gets in the middle of this, he loses his hat to a tree, he grabs a flag, and then he pulls a sword out of his sheath. No, he doesn't. He pulls his, the sword is rusted in his sheath. So he's gotta detach it and so he's got a flag in one hand 
and a sword in the sheath in the other, and he's yelling, Rally, Jackson's with you. Rally, men. Remember Winder. Where's my Stonewall Brigade? And the effect had to have been electric, no matter what's going on here. And from that point, to, according to all the Confederate accounts, the tide of battle turns. Now, it wasn't all these guys Jackson rallied because they still were not organized and they still didn't get their act together to move forward. Right next to all this going on is Lawrence O'Brien Branch's five, five North Carolina regiments all lined up ready to advance because A.P. Hill has finally come up. So he's all ready to go. Lawrence O'Brien Branch is 40 years old. He did more at 20 than we have. He, was, he graduated from both Princeton and University of North Carolina. He, he's, he's been a lawyer, he's been a newspaper writer, he's, he's run a railroad, he's been a congressman. He was nominated as the U.S. Post, uh, he was mat, nominated for uh, a cabinet position in eight, by James Buchanan, and by 40 now, he is in command of this brigade. And so what's a great politician do in the middle of a battle? He's giving a speech to his men before they go forward. Blah, 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 rah, let's go. Jackson sees this, sends a staffer over there, go take care of Larry. <laughs> Anytime now, we can move forward, let's do this. And Branch is going to go forward and start clearing the woods of all those Federals that, that are in those woods. Now, according to one of Jeb Stewart's staff officers who was with Jackson, that day, a man named uh, William Blackford, and this, is written, uh, this was written after the war and published in, eight, in 1948. So I'm sure this is absolutely accurate in what I'm about ready to say. <laughs> According to Blackford, he had a young federal blonde-haired soldier had his hat off with a broken sword, taking him back as a prisoner. This young soldier got so caught up in this moment, started waving his broken sword, yelling, hurrah for Jackson, rally around your general, boys. Got all set up. He's on the wrong team. He's on Team Blue, not Team Gray. <laughs> Blackford sees this and says, I'm sure you're a good lad. Go off to the woods that way. And he releases this guy. I am sure this absolutely accurately happened. Um, absolutely, I can guarantee. I'm sure there's other documentation. I just haven't found it yet. <laughs> the best part of this, though, is remember Jackson couldn't pull the sheath out of the sword, right? This is what he told his, troop, his, his students at VMI before he left VMI. He didn't follow his own directions. Okay, next slide. So, Augur's men have gone forward under Geary and Prince. And you can see by this time of the fight, it's now green because Augur has been wounded. John Geary has been wounded. Henry Prince has been captured. So, George Sears Green is in charge of that whole side of the battlefield now. Sam, this is all Samuel Crawford's guys, all those little, little dots, because they're all broken up because Lawrence O'Brien Branch and his North Carolinians have cl started clearing the woods. The last group in this advance, finally, is George Gordon's brigade. And he's got the 2nd Massachusetts, 3rd Wisconsin, those guys that went charging across that field and got massacred in two minutes, and the 27th Indiana. They're going to go across. You remember that sign of me, a picture of me putting that sign in in the big middle? That's the field these guys are going across. So, where I was is where the Stonewall Brigade was looking down. George Archer, or John Archer's guys, are over here looking down. Branch's guys are over here having a good time clearing these guys out. Oh, look at these guys over here, going downhill on them. And finally, Dorsey Pinder over here has moved around everybody and gets within 50 yards of the 27th Indiana and starts firing into their flanks. How's this going to turn out for John Gordon, or George Gordon? Not very well. They break and they run. At that point, the battle is turned for the Confederates. There's no hope of recovery for the Federals. So what does Banks do? He's going to send more infantry into the fight. Next slide. He's going to sell, oh, we're going to talk about, I forgot we talked about John Neff. John Neff is in the Stonewall Brigade. He is their commander, but not this day. He has been, he, he is under arrest by Charles Winder, his division commander. 
it seems that Jackson had him working on something, on a court martial if I remember correctly, and Winder says, no, I want you to do this. No, the boss wants me to do that. No, you're going to do this. I'm, I'm doing this for the boss. No, you're going to do this. Takes, puts him under arrest. So on August 9th, he advances with the 33rd Virginia in the ranks with the rest with his men without a, without a weapon, without a sword. That's the kind of leader he was. Unfortunately, he's going to uh, die in three weeks at Bronner's Farm. And I believe his coat is in the museum at Luray. So, interesting guy. All right, so last gasp. Again, North Carolinians have come up and they're starting to shove everybody back. The guys, Banks needs to buy some time to get everybody off the field. They've all come in on one road, so that's the road they came in, that's the road they know they need to leave on. So everybody's heading to this one road and it's becoming a huge funnel. It's a problem. So Banks orders the 10th Maine forward. The 10th Maine goes up over a hill and down into the field, into the setting sun by now. It's, it's close to quarter to eight. The sun is setting. They're going into not just Garnett's brigade, but Archer's brigade and Ronald's brigade. And here comes Tolliver and here comes Early. Five brigades, one regiment. Uh, Colonel, Colonel Tr Edward Beale, Edward Beale sees this and says, oh, this is stupid. Halts his men, tells them to turn around. At that point, our boy Henry Palouse from Banks' staff rides over and says, go forward. No, I'm not. Go forward. These guys are having an argument on horses, on a battlefield. Federals are here, Confederates are here, they're right here having this argument. And they finally said, let's get these guys over the hill. We'll finish this argument. They go back over the hill undercover. Beale loses the argument and his, and his, and his uh, 460 officers and men go forward. And they're, gonna, and they're gonna spend 30 minutes on a firing line, slowing down the Confederate advance and they're gonna lose 179 guys. So Banks isn't through. So what's he gonna do? He's gonna send the 1st Battalion Pennsylvania Cavalry to charge up the road. 162 guys under Richard Falls because 430, 461 guys didn't work, so let's send 162 again to buy time and slow them down. So Dick Falls says, yes sir, gets on their horses and they go charging down the road again into all that infantry. They can't turn that way because there's fences along the road, so they turn out this way into the fields and by the end of the night, 61 men answer the roll call. Over, they'll have over 100 by the time it's all done, but that night, only 61 are going to re respond to that call. It's a bad thing for the Federals. 54th Massachusetts, if you know the story of Glory, you know the story of Robert Gouldshaw. Bob to his friends, that's Bob. He was Bob. Uh, he served in the 2nd Massachusetts at the Battle of Cedar Mountain, but he wasn't with the the regiment that day, he's on Alphelius Williams, the division commander's staff. He's running, he's running orders back and forth. So he wasn't in on the fighting. These are his five close friends. All five are going to die. This is what he wrote about to his, to his mother afterwards. The view on the field, the view on the battlefield was a sight never to be forgotten. It was full, it was full of horror. For nearly a mile, the dead lay scattered in heaps, many disemboweled. Uh, de uh, de decapitated and mangled by shells. The temperatures also were around the 100 degree mark, speeding the de de decomposition process and adding to the fell or alter of the landscape. Among the dozen of corpses, they found the five officers, four captains and a lieutenant. Shaw found the first captain, Richard Carey, lying on his back, his head resting on a board and his hands crossed over his chest. He had been mortally wounded and according to an injured sergeant who laid nearby, lingered for some hours before he died. Shaw observed he looked calm and peaceful as if he were merely sleeping. His face was beautiful and I could have stood and looked at it for a long while. Shaw then discovered Williams and the two other captains, Edward Abbott and Richard Godwin, clustered together where the regiment made its last stand. He judged all three had been killed instantly and he didn't attempt to describe their appearance except to note all were much disfigured and the heat was very great. The last man, Lieutenant Stevens Perkins saw stated, 
was some distance to the rear, lying on his back with his face to the front as if he had turned in the retreat. In 30 minutes, the second had suffered 173 casualties, about a third of the 496 officers and men engaged. On the other end of the field, there's this guy. When Seth Green, or, or George Green, became the division commander, James Tate, commander of the 1st District of Columbia Infantry, somebody you never hear about, and I can't find any documentation, very little documentation on these guys. He's the commander of the 1st District of Columbia Infantry. He becomes the brigade commander. And see, he does a good job. He holds back the Confederate advances coming off the mountain. But his story really takes place in November of 1863. Tate resigns from the 1st DC and becomes the provost marshal in the District of Columbia. He's a cop. He's basically a cop. On February 27th, 1863, he is convicted of two charges of neglect of duty and disobedience of orders by a general court-martial. He's court-martialed. It all stems from an incident that takes place on Valentine's Day. He issues a pass to a guy named W.A. Stewart to transport four trunks containing articles of merchandise, not contraband, which have been examined. So he says, this isn't contraband, and he signs this document. Well, somebody else took a look at those trunks, and they found in, that, in those trunks about, you ready for this? 4,000 packs of playing cards. <laughs> playing cards have to have that, like a tax stamp on it. No tax stamp. So, he's later acquitted of these charges, and Lincoln, who reviews all the court-martials, sees this and says, oh, no way, we're going after this guy. But he's already left the service. So what's he doing in the post-war? He serves in various D.C. officers on the Board of Commissioners and is a Justice of the Peace. Nothing changes in D.C. August 9th is a full moon. The Federals are have retreated. They've retreated back across this field. Way back early in the talk, I talked about rickets coming down at a place called Colvern's Tavern. Colvern's Tavern is just over a mile from the battlefield. They sat and watched the entire fight from their position at Colvern's Tavern. Why did they do that? Because James Ricketts didn't have orders. In 1862, you do not follow initiative, your own initiative, you follow orders. If you follow initiative and something goes wrong, you're no longer in the Army. No orders, no movement. So until, until Pope showed up on the field late in the fight, Ricketts moved from Colvin's Tavern down to these hills and set up a position where Banks' men could retreat and filter through. So he's on this hill, 10 o'clock at night. The two fresh brigades that the Confederates have under Charles Field and James Stafford advance up the road with Willie Pegram's Purcell artillery going up there with him. Pegram sees these guys retreating in the full moon and says, we're gonna have some fun, and starts firing his four, his four guns at the retreating, at the retreating uh, federal guys. Unfortunately, there's four federal batteries out there, and you're kind of obvious at 10 o'clock at night firing artillery. Uh, you kind of see where you are, and so those four federal artilleries light onto them, and the Confederates say that the action lasted an hour. I give it 15 minutes best. And this is what, this is what, and this is the evidence of what, and this is what happened to Pegram's guns. This is the first photo of something dead on a battlefield. It was taken on August 11th, 1862, two days after the fight. Timothy O'Sullivan, the photographer, had left Culpeper, and as he came down the road, this is the first sign of, of, of the battle he found, and he took these photos. Uh, eight horses. There were also two lieutenants with their heads decapitated and a destroyed caisson down there. He'll take another photo of soldiers on the battlefield out here with some dead horses uh, bookending them. The first, the first dead humans we have come a month later at Antietam. This is the first time someone sees that. If you think about the prince, the courier and I prince, the crowd spins early in the war, all these men marching nobly across the field and there's always one casualty back there and there's three or four guys holding his head up. And it didn't happen that way, folks. It didn't happen. So let's talk about the human cost. Next slide. These are the uh, top five the winners on each side. And you look at, and you look at Crawford's Brigade, the 40, 46th Pennsylvania, 5th Connecticut, 28th New York, and 10th Maine. Those are the guys that did the brunt of the fighting for these guys. And if, and if you remember, I, I talked about, um, I think it was 13 casualties in 
13 missing in Geary's Brigade. Look at the number of captured missing from the 46th Pennsylvania, 5th Connecticut, 28th New York, and 10th Maine. Close to, close to 400. Close to 400 men are going to be captured. And that's because they got into those woods and were fighting in there. And when things went to pot with Branch came back, they couldn't get out. And they became, if they, if they weren't killed, they were captured. What makes this really interesting is, again, 22,000 Confederates on the field, about 9,000 Federal. They had 2,381 casualties, 21%. That is the largest percent of casualties in a battle by participants in the Eastern Theater during the war. Yes, Antietam, Gettysburg, more casualties, obviously more casualties, but casualties compared to those engaged, Cedar Mountain is the largest percentage loss in the East. Only Stones River in Tennessee and Alusty in Florida had higher numbers throughout the war. So unfortunately, we're number one. Now I mentioned, I mentioned the, uh, the truce. The truce was on August 11th. It was a chance to bury the dead that they could, and, and recover the wounded that they could still find. Uh, there was a picnic out there that day. Uh, Samuel Crawford and some other Federals got together with Jeb Stewart and Jubal Early and some others, some old wartime friends, and they got together and they had some conversations. Uh, a couple bets were made. But I found this and I thought this is kind of interesting. This is Jeb Stewart and George Bayard. Uh, Bayard had been at West Point and then served in the same company with, in the 1st Cavalry with, with Jeb Stewart. So these guys know each other post-war. The two officers met again under a flag of truce for the burial of the dead, where they conversed as old friends do. No allusions were made to the present war, uh, but spoke of former associations. During the interview, recounted one observer, a wounded, a wounded Union soldier lying on the ground was groaning and asking for water. Here, Jeb. Bayard said, an old time recollections coming back to him. He tossed his bridle to the rebel officer and went to the stream and brought the wounded man some water. As Bayard mounted his horse, Jeb remarked that was the first time he'd played orderly to a Union general, Jeb being a major general in the service. The business for which they had met was soon arranged, the bugle sounded recall, and they shook hands and turned away to be mortal enemies once again. But for that brief time, they were friends and recalled all times. Next slide. All right, that's Henry Abbott. He is in the 20th Massachusetts. And that's his brother, Ned. Ned, he's one of those folks who died and one of Bob Shaw's friends. Henry got on the battlefield September 21st, 1863, 13 months after the battle, uh, with another officer who was there. And he wrote to his mother about this experience. <clears throat> and you can tell how he feels about Nathaniel Banks and George Gordon. Of the man who ordered the battle generally and the advance of Gordon's brigade in particular, it is enough to say he is fully as infamous as Burnside after his Fredericksburg assault. The general position of the rebels with their right resting on the impregnable Cedar Mountain, their lines running along other ridges and woods, it is enough to say that their position was strong by nature at any rate for a good sized army. Ned came through the woods skirmishing as he advanced where he was met by heavy fire front and right of the bushes, driving him back with a tremendous loss and the back edge of the woods is where he was at last hit. When I look at this place, I think he was murdered. How could an officer cross this open field rising towards the rebels with his right completely uncovered, offering the strongest temptation for the rebels to creep across through the bushes and entirely outflank him? Think of that noble life loss by the heartless vanity of a politician who wishes to have newspapers say he advanced. I don't think Henry likes Nathaniel Banks. Henry's going to die on the wilderness on May 6, 1864. 28th New York, Western New York guys, lost their flag late in the fight to the 5th Virginia Infantry. That night in Orange, one of the prisoners of the, of the, uh, of the 28th saw the flag and cut out a small piece, kind of hard to see, right there in the center. Gave it to their com surviving commander, Lieutenant Colonel Edwin Brown. He kept it in his pocket after the war every day. In 1882, he struck it through the War Department. He works for the, uh, one of the veterans groups, and he sees these flags out here, and he looks at it and says, that's my flag. I want it back. I want my flag back. Well, okay, sure, fine, go ahead. Takes the flag back, goes back to New York, writes a letter that fall 
to the 5th Virginia Regimental Association in the Shenandoah Valley and say, we're having our annual meeting next May. Why don't you come on up and join us? Fifth Virginia guys get this and say, well, this is different. This is new. What do you want to do? And they say, why not? So 153 veterans, friends, and hangers-on travel from, from Stanton, Virginia up to Buffalo, New York. Now, a couple stops before Buffalo, Brown gets on the train and hands back that flag to the Confederates. So the next day in Buffalo, a one-legged Confederate major returned a Union battle flag to a one-armed Union colonel. It was the first time of many these two units got together. The following year, the, the 28th had their, annu their, their annual meeting in Virginia with the 5th. I can't find evidence of a North-South reunion before this date. It probably it could have happened, but I can't find evidence. This is the first time guys from the North and guys from the South, so this is 12, 18 years, 18 years after this battle, before the first reunion at Gettysburg, get together. They kept meeting, and again, their last time they got together was in 1902 for the dedication of the monument at the Culpeper National Cemetery and a monument out in Cedar Mountain. In 1901, we're almost done. In 1901, Judge Daniel Grimsley, a uh, Culpeper judge and former Virginia delegate, uh, said, went to the Board of Supervisors and said, I want to put monuments on the battlefield. I'm going to do Cedar Mountain, Brandy Station, Kelly's Ford, and Morton's Ford. And they said, yeah, okay, fine. Here's $1,500 for seed money. So he's got that seed money. He writes letters in all the papers in the, in the, in the National Tribune and the, and the Confederate Veteran Magazines and other newspapers saying, come to Culpeper next August. And we'll have a party, we'll have some fried chicken, read some poems, and we'll go out and we'll mark the battlefield. And so a bunch of people get together and they do that and they're riding their horses out there in August 1901 and they're staking, putting wooden stakes in the ground, marking where all these units were. Then he goes, five dollars please, five dollars please. He collects a subscription of five dollars from everybody to pay for all this and they pay for it. Now according to this map that we have, there are 56 markers on that that were put in the field. We know there were more because one of the markers says Geary's, Geary's Ohio Brigade, those four Ohio regiments. We have recovered from the field at least, we have recovered three regimental markers from that Ohio Brigade. So the Ohio guys got back in Ohio and said, well, Geary's Brigade's nice, but I want to recognize the 66 Ohio. And so they raised money for their own markers. So there was more than 56 out there. And so between the markers that, that, Geer, that uh, Grimsley put out there, there's a United Daughters of Confederacy marker out there in the early 1920s, and there's five regimental monuments out there. Culpeper or Cedar Mountain was the fifth most monumented battlefield in the, in the 1920s, behind Gettysburg, Antietam, Chickamauga, and, and Vicksburg. So we were number five, we were number five. And here's some of these monuments. Here's the ones that are on the battlefield. The big one, the third Wisconsin, is uh, the only one on preserved property. Uh, here's our 28th New York out there. All three of these, the 28th New York, the, the 27th Indiana, and the 46th Pennsylvania are probably within 20 yards of one another. So we're thinking that the owner of that property at the time said, here's a quarter of acre land, put all your monuments there. And so that's why they're all there together. And then there's monuments for the Battle of Cedar Mountain at the Culpeper National Cemetery as well. Again. Uh, there's over 912 unknown at Cedar Mountain Battle National Cemetery, and many of them are, uh, uh, of those unknowns, many of them are from Cedar Mountain. Go figure, I wrote a book, and it's for sale. So what, I, what I've done with Ryan is because these guys have been so generous to me, I'm going to sell all his books first, so all the money will go to the Holland, Muse Holland Lane Office Museum, and then after you, after you buy all his, you can start buying mine. And with that, one more slide. Thank you for listening, and I'll answer any questions you might have entertained. Yes? Uh, generally, they were, for the most part, the brigade commanders were in their late 20s and 30s. There's an example either way, of course. George Sear Green, I believe, was the oldest guy on the battlefield, and he was probably 60 at the time because I think he was 61 at Gettysburg. 
So that's a year later. So Latimer, Latimer was 18. A lot, a lot of these, they're, they're kids. They're kids. You know, some, this is their first fight. Samuel Crawford, you hear a lot about Samuel Crawford during the war. He was a pre-war surgeon. He's a doctor. And he's at, he's at Fort Sumpner as Fort Sumpner's doctor. This is his first command of an infantry unit during the war. Cedar Mountain. He's, he's breaking him. He's breaking him. Absolutely. He's breaking him. They all, yeah, they, well, a lot of these are not photos from that time, obviously. Latimer's young. Uh, there was a guy named McHenry Howard who was an aide to uh, uh, Winder who was in his 20s. But most of these photos you're going to see are late in the war or even some post-war photos because that's, that's you know. They, yep, yeah, they, yeah, exactly. Hair didn't have. Well, Jeb Stewart had that beautiful beard. His West Point nickname was Beauty because he had a weak chin. And so as soon as he got out of West Point, he grew that beard so you couldn't see that chin. So a lot of times there was reason. And the other times, soldiers would get wounded in the face at a previous battle and grow a beard to hide that, hide that scar, hide that wound. So that's another reason why he grew a beard. Yes? Mike, is this the uh, battle, I believe it's after, this isn't when uh, Stonewall eventually court-martials Garnett, right? So that's not... Different Garnett. Oh, no, 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 no. The, the Garnet here that fought is a, is a different Garnet. He's a cousin. Okay. The so Garnet from Kernstown, they're at, that's one reason why Jackson moves from Orange, or from Gordonsville to Orange, is because they start that trial, Garnet's trial, just before the battle begins. And there's two days of testimony. Jackson gets on the, st on the, on the stand the first day. And Garnett is his own, ju own lawyer, and he just rips into Jackson, looks at everything he said, and rips into him. And then the second day, all of Garnett's subordinates get on the stand and back up Garnett. And Jackson says, this is going nowhere. Fortunately for Jackson, John Pope's on the march, so the court-martial never resumes. But yes, the, and if you really want, it's interesting stuff. Those transcripts are available. They're, they're in the uh, supplement to the OR. So you can find them out there. A long time you couldn't find the, find the transcripts, but they're there. All kinds of stories. All kinds of stories. How we, how, you, how we doing with time? Probably, probably like 10.30. Okay, so there we go. So if there's no other questions, thank you very much. I enjoyed coming up here.